um, is a former PhD student of ours. Uh, he was born in Leeds uh, and he studied medicine in Leeds uh, and then he became a GP in Bournemouth, which is how we uh, came to know him. Um, he took a master's degree in Jewish history and culture um, at the, uh, in our department and with his uh, GP's background uh, he showed an understandable uh, interest and uh, expertise and talent for um, medical um, history too. So uh, when he finished his uh, master's program he uh, then started a, a PhD with us um, which was focused on comparing the history of London Jewish Hospital with the London German Hospital. Howard uh, successfully completed and defended um, an excellent PhD despite uh, in the latter stages sadly having to contend with pancreatic cancer um, which uh, eventually was to take him from us all um, and it's really to, to mark his achievements then that we uh, initiated this uh, lecture his achievements uh, as a student uh, and his support for the Parks Institute really um, embody what we are here to do and it's very much uh, people like Howard who, who, who give our work so much of its, of its meaning and purpose and it really felt then um, um, more than natural to, to institute the, the Howard Ryan Memorial Lecture in his memory. Now uh, tonight's lecture is on the, uh, the medical liberation of Belson and on the presence of British uh, doctors uh, at that extended moment and it's given by two uh, members of our own institute and um, Professor Tony Kushner um, is uh, both a member and a former director of the institute and amongst his very wide-ranging uh, works on modern Jewish history and culture and uh, Holocaust uh, history. He has produced a number of uh, provocative and pioneering um, uh, pieces on the liberation of uh, Belson going back to really the 1990s. Um, and he's joined by uh, Dr. Amy Bunting, who is uh, another illustrious uh, alumnus of, of the uh, Parks MA and PhD program. I won't spare her blushes here. Um, formerly a lecture, lecturer in our department too, uh, and she now teaches at um, Godolphin and Latimer School in London while continuing to, to maintain an active research interest in uh, Jewish history and culture. Um, so in a minute I'm going to hand the floor over to them. Um, just by way of uh, uh, affirming, I suppose, the modalities and the etiquette of these online occasions, um, we ask people to keep their uh, cameras and their microphones turned off during the, um, during the lecture, just to, to make sure we'll have as uh, a good a listening experience as possible with the available bandwidth. Um, you are very welcome to write questions into the chat function of the um, uh, of the of the webinar um, as we go, and afterwards I will then um, pick out some of those questions um, and and put those to our speakers. I think because because the uh, event is being recorded, um, there are issues involved with um, permissions and speaking, which means that we have to take these questions via the. Uh, chat function, but I will do our, my best and we'll do our best to get through as, as, as many of them as, as we can. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to uh, Tony and to Amy and the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Neil, and uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, it's a great shame we won't have our normal Sharabang from Bournemouth, but I think you are there with us virtually. So. Good evening and welcome. So the medical liberation of Belson, British co-presence. We are deeply honored to give this the fourth Howard Rain Memorial Lecture. I knew Howard not as my doctor, but as an MA then doctoral student. He was simply a lovely man and a pleasure and inspiration to work with. I can even forgive him that presently Leeds United are ahead of Manchester City in the Premier League. This would have brought Howard a lot of pleasure and I'm sure he would have been too much a gentleman to have rubbed it in too much. But talking to Howard about his life as a doctor and to Corinne in recent years, he told me recently that he had, uh, he had been Dorothy Parks' GP in her later life when she settled in Bournemouth. 
after James Park's death in 1981. I knew Howard embodied the ethos well before it was formalized of patient-centered medicine, defined as being about focusing care on the needs of the individual, ensuring that people's preferences, needs and values guide clinical decisions and providing care that is respectful of and responsive to them. Whether this ideal was possible or was realistic to expect in what we are exploring tonight is debatable, but we will far from ignore it as a theme. In our lecture, we will confront medical care at its most extreme, what one of our principal characters, the Irish surgeon, Dr. Robert Collis, described in 1947 as the most extraordinary liberation in the history of the world, that of Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. With equal hyperbole, perhaps not surprising given the closeness to the events he related, as well as his literary skills as a writer and playwright, Collis from Churchillian Road, we never hear of that these days in politics, added, never in the history of medicine has a more gallant action been fought against disease than during the first week, week, few weeks after liberation. Whilst we will outline briefly in the first section of our lecture, the remarkable work that the doctors, mostly young medical students and nurses carried out, our focus will be on two key figures important, not only in treating the survivors of Belsen, but in creating a memory of the camp and more generally the history of the Holocaust. The first shown in, in the first uh, slide um, is Brigadier Hugh Llewellyn Glenn Hughes, born in South Africa in 1892, but not surprisingly given his name of Welsh origin. Indeed, Hughes was brought up in South Wales following the sudden death of his father in South Africa in 1896. He was rescued from poverty through the award of, of a scholarship to Epsom College and had a more than distinguished uh, record in both world wars and as a doctor between them. It was as deputy director of medical service in the second army that in the spring of 1945, Hughes was diverted to Belsen two days after it had been handed over to the British army by the Wehrmacht with the war still raging around it. The Nazis were concerned about the spread of rampant typhus from the camp uh, and remarkably um, gave the camp up to the British as war was uh, going on around it. Hughes was on the 15th of April, two days after the, uh, that, that mini treaty, the first British medical officer into Belsen. His first action was to assess the, the appalling situation, making plans for the separation of those who could be saved from the indescribable filth they were living and dying in. What R Richard Dimbleby in his iconic BBC broadcast called the cesspit of Belsen. There was a description that was used by many of the doctors when trying to describe to others what they were experiencing. Our second character is Robert Collis, who, as will emerge, was a less straightforward individual with a strong roguish element. He's, um, in, he's proving a little reluctant, but we'll find him uh, to come out. <laughs> Oh, there he goes. Uh, and now we can see him in later life uh, and also in rugby mode, which we'll come to later. Born in County Dublin in 1900 from a landed Protestant background, he became a distinguished pediatrician working for the Red Cross in the war. In Holland, he was given the opportunity to, to divert with a small team of Dutch nurses to help in Belsen. He arrived at Belsen a week or so after Hughes. At this point, we want to introduce the term co-present as a concept, which we believe is an important addition to our understanding of the principal actors in the Holocaust. Still dominant in academic uh, and popular literature is the tripartite court uh, room inspired category of perpetrator, victim, bystander. It is the bystander category uh, that we are especially querying, and we are not alone in so doing. In dictionary terms, the bystander is a person who is present at an event or incident, but does not take part. There is thus an inert quality to the bystander in such definitions, which has led recently to Michael Rothberg coin, coining an alternative term, what he calls implicated subjects. Rob 
Rothberg does so with regard to many different challenging situations, including the Holocaust and apartheid South Africa, both of which we will we mention, um, the latter we'll mention in passing later. Here, there is no real question of our British medical figures being labeled as implicated subjects. Not that we want to present them as purely saintly two-dimensional figures. Instead, we will follow Elmer Wachterhand in his neglected work um, from the early 1980s, interviewing Germans who lived in close proximity to the concentration camps. To Wachterhand, co-present was much more appropriate because less awkward terms, he said, such as witness and bystander, do not, do not really apply. What we would insist on here, following left of hand, is the agency of our medical figures. They impacted on those they were trying to help, and as will become clear, Belson impacted on the, on the rest of their lives. Indeed, they confronted the intense weeks as liberators again and again, as they narrated these experiences in the public sphere after, the, after 1945. What follows is thus a cultural history of the medical liberation. And whilst this, uh, uh, this might at first sight appear as Jewish medical history only in the sense that Jews were treated as patients, what will emerge is that in both our major case studies, Jewishness became a major part of their lives post April 1945, shape, shaping their self definitions. In short, the boundaries between Jewishness and non Jewishness became, became blurred in this acute example of interrelationships. Turning to the medical liberation, under the leadership of Hughes and his successor, Lieutenant Colonel Johnson, and several others, realizing the scale of the crisis, they called for further support, which led, amongst other initiatives, to the diversion of 96 medical students who had been intended for famine relief work in the Netherlands, alongside a number of British and foreign nurses who came along as well. Almost all of these medical students, in one form or another, recorded their experiences in Belsen, many of which are now deposited at the Imperial War Museum. Their reports and diaries are intriguing in themselves, the students struggling to find the right discourse to describe a medical, but ultimately a humanitarian crisis that they were overwhelmed by and unprepared for. It is easy to be critical of their attempts at, at, at keeping a sense of normality. Some devised a raft uh, to punt around the lake in the barracks where they were billeted in the Belson camp complex. Their behavior with alcohol and fraternizing with the nurses would not have been out of place in any medical school in Britain and in cruder manifestations of masculinity. Michael Hargrave, um, who died tragically young, described his boredom as a medic in Belson and relief when it was over in late May 1945. On a day off, Hargreaf decided to tidy his tent. And he wrote, as it was beginning to bear a strong resemblance to the conditions in Camp 1, what was often referred to simply as the horror camp. What is perhaps more significant than such gaucheness and hijinks is that only once in his 87-page diary does Hargreaf make any reference to the Jewishness of the Belson inmates, even though they were two-thirds of them. More generally, there is nothing on who they were and how they had got there. Instead, they are regarded purely as medical challenges, which he feels nurses would have been able to perform better than himself. His three-year medical training was not of much use to him. This is not to argue that these medical students shrugged off their days in Belson, far from it. Some were left in a state we would now regard as post-traumatic stress, and others caught typhus. A study of 60 of them found that whilst it did not impact on the direction of medical careers, though five went into psychiatric work, for all of them, according to Claire Hilton, a leading medical historian, it reinforced their desire to help people in need. One of them, Russell Barton, ringleader of the Belson Lake Raft, uh, became a leading figure in reforming psychiatric care and the abuses of institutionalization. Belson never left them, even if for most it would be an experience they internalized and did not speak about to family. And yet coming a little later to Bell's than Hughes and his, and his immediate colleagues and cocooned in their accommodation, they have perhaps not seen the worst. 
Barton was firmly put in his place in the columns of the Times in the 1960s uh, by Hughes uh, when he suggested in print that the conditions in Belson were, I quote, not that bad. Flynn Hughes has quite rightly been brought centre stage again through the very recent study from Leeton Hill by American scholar Bernice Late Lerner. Lerner juxtapos juxtaposes the war experiences of Hughes and her mother, 15 year old Rachel Genoth, who had been transported to Auschwitz from Hungary and then was part of the forced movement to Belsen. For reasons of space, we'll, we will outline only briefly Hughes's remarkable role not only as the first medical liberator, but also as a key witness in the Belson trial in autumn 1945. Hughes first gave his testimony alongside Johnson and Lieutenant Colonel Lipscomb, all from the Royal Army Medical Corps, to the Royal Society of Medicine in early June 1945. The transcript was intended to be used by the War Office as, a, as they put it, as a write-up to the press, but as we will see, Collis beat them to it. His detailed account in the British Medical Journal was described as first rate by the War Office, and there was no need for any other press publicity. As with the case of almost all such reports, um, including uh, Collis's earlier one, Glenn Hughes was factual to focus on numbers and overall medical treatment of the survivors. He started rather hesitantly by saying he wasn't, was unsure of what he needed to cover this distinguished uh, society, royal society, and he granted himself only the occasional personal insight, such as how the scale of the concentration camp system provided, quote, some idea of the mentality of the people who ran these camps. This contrasts with Johnston, uh, his, his junior, a quiet and gentle man who started his presentation to the Royal Society much more emotionally. He said, my own first impression of the camp were those of incredulity rather than horror. I just could not believe what I saw. But these feelings rapidly changed to an anger I had never experienced before, to a loathing of the SS men and women who had controlled the camp and of the entire German nation who had allowed this thing to happen. He ended even more provocatively. The German nation, he said, was responsible, responsible for that horror camp, for the 23,000 people we buried there, and for the thousands buried before we arrived, and for all the bestialities which were practiced in that place. In other words, for mass murder. I can never forget that fact, he said. He, he ended in, in, a, in a very provocative way. The only danger is, gentlemen, can you? Collis describes Johnson as a human creature in an army world uh, who, in, who insisted that no harshness be used against the internees, however challenging their behavior post-liberation. Johnston's influence was immense. Collins believed, until he left, kindness was the watchword of, of the liberated camp. There seems little doubt that Hughes shared that sentiment of anti-Germanism when the horror camp one was ceremoniously burnt down on the 21st of May, alongside the caricature of Hitler, Union Jack hoisted and Colonel Byrd, the commanding officer, attacking, attacked the Germans for the atrocity that was Belson and stating that the British flag did not stand for bestiality. It was Hughes who employed one of the flamethrowers. Hughes was insistent that the liberation, including the medical relief, was, as he put it, an army problem from the first. Many of his public interventions thereafter, uh, and certainly in the non-Jewish sphere, were to make sure that the Royal Army Military Corps would be made the central focus of accounts of liberation and to correct any deviations from that narrative. It was partly for this reason that he and other members of the RAMC were irritated by the interventions of Robert Collins. Alongside this suppression of emotion in Hughes's early accounts was the lack, lack of reference to the Jewishness of the large majority of Belson's victims. This was true of also of his evidence to the second and third days of the Belson trial in Lunenburg in September 1945. Here, Glenn Hughes, was, uh, Glenn Hughes was more imaginative with his language, and rather he acknowledged the limitations of trying to convey the reality of Belson, while still understandably maintaining a medical discourse to relate the early days of liberation. He said, the conditions in the camp were really indescribable. 
No description nor photographs could really bring home the horrors that were outside the hut, with worse inside. Struggling in a rather suburban way to communicate his lack of reference point, Hughes concluded that I have been a doctor for 30 years and I've seen all the horrors of war, but I have never seen anything to touch it. In 1945, there was a tuners to Hughes's response. He became angry if there was any criticism of the medical work his team did in Belsen and any attempt to take credit away from it, reserving his fury at the Nazis struck Germans in the form of action the burning of Camp One. And whilst he did not refer to Jews in his reports, he forged deep bonds with the leaders uh, of the emerging displaced person camp in Belsen and shared the narrative of those such as its leader, Joseph Rosenstaff, uh, who became a close friend of, of Hughes. That is, that this was a safe uh, remnant that would find a new home and redemption in the Jewish state in Palestine. His support for this and his opposition to the refusal of the British state to accept a distinctive Jewishness of the survivors possibly cost Hughes future promotion to general or above, uh, which he, his incredible record would have deserved, and it caused him some distress after the war. Instead, he identified fully with the survivors, attended their Zionist oriented conventions in um, the autumn of 1945, and relished their support of him. Uh, through the naming of the Glyn Hughes Hospital in Belsen as displaced person camp. Thereafter, Hughes was a regular feature in Belsen reunions and commemorations in Israel, America, and returning to Belsen itself over the next decades. He became, in Rosenstaff's words, the adopted father of the Jewish survivors of Belsen. Isaac Levy, one of the Jewish chaplains at Belsen, had been asked by Hughes to say a prayer for the Belsen martyrs uh, at at uh, Hughes's funeral, uh, and Levy did this in January 1974. In a recent study, Lerner highlights how the horror of Belson never left Hughes, quoting him in 1965, 20 years after liberation, that for him and the other liberators, diabolical pictures have a habit of emerging. But he had the empathy to realize that for survivors, this was on another level of pain. By then, Hughes in, in 1965 was able to reflect more in his testimony than he had in at the uh, point of liberation, stating that Belson was unique in its vile treatment of human beings. Nothing like it had happened before in the history of mankind, he said. In a footnote, Lerner suggests that Hughes did not share the antisemitism of many middle class English of his day. It is perhaps hard to know the full complexity of Hughes's attitude towards Jews other than to say he felt totally at ease in their company and politics in Belsen and developed close, very close friendships thereafter with the survivors, who became part of his extended family, as Rosenstaff's quote beautifully illustrated. Robert Collis cr equally created for himself a Jewish family from Belsen, albeit a more intimate and complicated one. His two-page obituary in the British Medical Journal of June 1975 described the life of a Cambridge, Yale and King's College graduate, of a director of paediatrics in Dublin, Ibadan and Lagos, of a 24-year-old commissioned officer in the Irish Guards and Rugby International, of an author and playwright whose work was considered for the Abbey Theatre in Dublin, and as the doctor and guardian to Christy Brown, immortalized in Daniel Day-Lewis's My Left Foot. In terms of historicizing the liberation of Belson, Robert Collis was the most important figure in early post-war Britain. He wrote two long and detailed articles for the British Medical Journal on the subject. In 1947, with his new Dutch wife, with whom he worked in Belson, the nurse Han Hogertseil, he wrote the best-selling Straight On, subtitled Journey to Belsen and the Road Home, which, through the personal testimony of Jewish survivors, also gave an informed narrative of Auschwitz-Birkenau. In all of his extensive autobiographical writing, Collis appears to deliberately perform his ambivalence towards Jews. He placed before the reader a Semitic discourse in which Jews were essentialized, 
often quite unpleasantly and essentially othered whilst writing angrily and simultaneously about the evils of anti-Semitism. In his crude ethnography, Jews were just one group amongst many that Collis placed in prejudice boxes. For example, he said, Dutchmen are husky, Americans are not Europeans, Russians are curious and suspicious, the Swedes are extremely humorless, and in Belsen he met English Cockneys, who he seems to relish, who were not arrogant in any way, despite having conquered the mad Germans. Indeed, David Cesarani, on the basis of such writings about Jews, decided that Robert Collis did not place much value on Judaism or Jewishness. Yet Collis, now described as the Irish Schindler, is more complicated than that, and perhaps unlike Glyn Hughes, was playful in his language and in his behaviour. The two men met briefly at Belsen and they almost came to blows. On the surface, this is surprising. Both were medical men of roughly the same age and had played rugby at the highest level for Blackheath and the Harlequins. They were outsiders in origin. Collis, privileged but treated with suspicion because of his Irishness abroad and his Protestantism at home. And Hughes, Welsh and poor. But they each had their own prejudices. Hughes against even moderate Irish nationalism and the medical newcomers in the uh, liberation, and Collis against the army and especially the quintessential English officer. Collis described himself as an internationalist and he concluded straight on with a call for new forms of supernationality, which would even embrace re-educated Germans. When Collis thus starts straight on with him in London after the war in the Jewish quarter, saying to a colleague, how I dislike these people. And when asked why, he replies, it didn't seem necessary to think why. He is in fact, we argue, challenging both himself and his reader to do just that. This is something new in the history of the world, Collis told a group of Red Cross medical students and members of the Dutch underground at a Red Cross base in Holland in 1945. Married with two young sons, as noted, he had gone to Europe as a medic with the Red Cross and had just returned from Bergen-Belsen. As his later writings on Belsen revealed, he did make an effort to understand the Jewish experience during the Holocaust. However, in 1945, Collis's comprehensive report on the conditions at Belsen to the British Medical Journal made no mention of Jews similar in this respect to those reports made by Hughes. And yet it was in the liberated Belsen that Collis began to build his new family with its Jewish members and his family would be shaped forever by his encounter with the Holocaust's Jewish victims. Belsen would not only eventually bring Collis a new wife, but also a different form of fatherhood and a further encounter with Jews. In Belsen, he found Han holding what he described as the most entrancing scrap of humanity in her arms. This scrap was Zoltan, who along with his sister Edith and two other children, Tibor and Susie, would become what Collis called his special children. Collis describes how it was Zoltan who chose his role as adopted father for him. Zoltan said, they have killed my father and now the doctor is my father. In 1951, Collis published The Ultimate Value, which tells the story of his relationship with the children immediately after Belsen. In this work, Collis makes what he calls observations about the Jewish identity of Belsen's victims. Firstly, in comparison to the gypsy survivors, whom he, of whom he said, they belong to a different species from the human inhabitants of the world. The Jews, he continued, were like the gypsies in the first characteristic, in that though they might call themselves Dutch or Italian, they seem to us more Jew than anything else. He went on, I realized that it would never have entered my mind 
to regard a little Dublin Jewish child as Irish. Such an idea would obviously be absurd. So it would be equally absurd to think of the 65 Jewish children in the camp who spoke Dutch as in any way Dutch children. For Collis, Jewishness seems to neutralize any other form of identity. Jews are more than stateless, they are simply unable to be anything other than Jews. Jewish children, he argued, reacted to suffering differently from other children. And in his words, in many ways, they seemed older mentally than children of our race, sometimes peculiarly adult. For Collis, it is as though their Jewish otherness and the history of suffering which he sees as a natural consequence of that, has given the children an otherworldly form of strength. And he says such extraordinary buffeting as their minds and bodies were exposed to would, I feel sure, have been too severe a strain for any Irish child. Collis does not refer to Zoltan and Edith directly as Jews, but describes them instead as Hungarian Slovaks. Their father had been Jewish, their mother non-Jewish, but deported with her family, having refused to leave her husband. Zoltan would later hint at the prejudice both his parents encountered at their marriage. My father's family saw his intended bride as a cultured young woman, but a Gentile. My mother's family saw a handsome young man, but a poor one and a Jew too. Always on the move, Robert Collis pieced together the history of the children on a trip to the Carpathian Mountains, prompted by the remarkable arrival of a letter to him from the children's Hungarian grandmother after the war. Using her memories, Collis decided to write the children's pre-Belson story. What Collis actually wrote is not personal to the children, but was his reading of the history of the Carpathian region including of the Slovak Jews, who he recorded had always done very well as Jews usually do. Collis's sense of the absurdity of the Jewish children belonging to any national group and his uncritical assumptions about Jewish economic success sit alongside an extraordinary account of a moment when he returned to Ireland. He says, some 17 Jews whom I had helped home from Belson in 1945, came together and gave me a banquet. When at last I rose to return thanks and said we had fought against the same evil in the world and were thus brothers and that their brothers and sisters who had died in the gas chambers were joined with ours who had fought and died to rescue them, they all wept. Despite a somewhat generous reading of British wartime policy regarding Jews, Collis nonetheless is able to see his own Belson Jews as part of a brotherhood of man, of a family. And here it is a purely constructed reading of a shared wartime experience, which seems to allow for him their otherness to be overcome. It is to Zoltan's memoirs that we must turn to understand Collis's next journey, this time to Africa. Collis himself does not reveal the reason behind his decision to leave, other than to say he felt he could no longer to continue to work in Ireland. Han had fallen pregnant with their first son, and as Zoltan remembers, Bob decided that the time had come for a divorce. This, of course, I am surmising, Zoltan states, because someone of Bob's class and character would never have dreamed of sitting me down and spelling it out. And it's probably noteworthy that Zoltan calls his adopted father by his first name. True to character, Collis did not only decide to leave for the sake of his wife or new partner, but also because as Zoltan recalls, Ireland was getting too small for Bob's talents and his I told you so's. Collis wanted the top job in the new children's hospital in Dublin, but it had been built with substantial input from the Catholic Church. And as a recently divorced Protestant, Collis stood no chance. And yet, a characteristically lucky meeting with a former assistant who was working in Nigeria 
and the offer of a job in Ibadan in almost the next breath, and Collis had what Zoltan called his chance at a new and exciting beginning, an adventure. He was off like a shot, bringing Han and the new baby Sean with him. As we will see, all of Collis's children would have to grapple with his absences, Belson survivors or not. Leaving his adopted Jewish children in Quaker boarding schools, Collis set off to Africa, which provided a new sense of familial belonging, a new world, and yet also for Collis, a sense of destiny, of predestined purpose. He says rather grandly, as I stepped out of the plane, my loneliness left me. I entered a new world. I was in Africa. Nothing, something stirred within me, a prevision, a knowledge of what was before me. I no longer had a feeling of loss, nor did the place I had come to seem strange. I knew I was in the right place at the right time with a purpose, part of the karma of this time of mine and the world. In Nigeria, Collis found a country in the process of throwing off its old world ties and beginning a new world of independence. Collis's memories of Africa also have that curious mixture of old world attitudes and a self-conscious need to state that he was part of the communities in which he worked and that it was Africa that had allowed him to claim a uh, world citizen status. He said, all my life I have heard Englishmen deprecating Irishmen and Irishmen Englishmen and not uncommonly unkind remarks about Jews, Egyptians and Portuguese whom the brisker Nordics tend to despise. Here we were in the middle of Africa with a complete mixture of nationalities sharing the vocation of doctoring and we found we could work together, like each other and even be close friends. Set that alongside the immediate following remark, I have never seen a clean hygienic town built and kept by black Africans, ancient or modern, and the complex nature of Collis's worldview is once more clear. And yet, when his domestic family interacts with his African family, Collis appears to foresee the global family to which he aspires. Here, in this um, image, Sean, his son, takes on an almost saviour-like role as part of a Nigerian festival. He says, it seems right that the only white person in the whole of that vast procession that day should be an Irish boy who was quite unaware that he was performing a part of any great significance in the second half of the 20th century, though his bearing suggested that subconsciously he knew he was carrying on his shoulders some of the tensions of the world. When Han gives birth to their second child, described by Collis as a poor little handicapped boy, another element is added to Collis's family and to his vision of that family in a wider world. Neil, whose happiness seems a surprise to his father, who notes, though handicapped, he was a lovely baby, provides another means by which Collis can illustrate his belief in common humanity. He tells of an encounter between baby Neil and a Nigerian woman with what Collis describes as a black disfigured old visage. And how when the two smile at one another, it is to Collis a moment of beauty in a world torn by fear. Forever a wanderer, crossing border borders and boundaries, Collis traveled across the African continent and he returned to his co-present Holocaust experience. Describing South African people, he said, generally they were exceedingly tough, splendid athletes, rather low brow and aggressive, especially we thought even then in their attitude to the N-word, a term they reserved for all races other than those of European origin. Collis begins his assessment of his time with one of his characteristic pseudo-anthropological -anthropo descriptions and his account illustrates his struggle to understand apartheid. He remarks with no hint of irony and in his often used Victorian tone that he had decided against an earlier visit to South Africa 
because he was traveling with a Nigerian professor and felt, quote, it might have caused unpleasantness to use different washrooms in the airport. However, when he does visit, it is his memories of Belson that intermingle with his experiences of apartheid, which he describes as a pseudo-Nazi ideology. He can note that he met educated Bantu women, delicate looking Indians and some charming coloreds, whilst also commenting that the South African refugee doctors he had worked with in Nigeria had fled just as the German Jews has had to flee Germany because the doctors had some progenitor who had come from a country outside the European ethnic groups whose colour had been brown or black. In Johannesburg, with its, in Collis's words, utter inequality based on colour alone, Collis remarks that the bitterness in the minds of the blacks seems to sour the very air so that a person coming from the outside world feels an angry compassion for the black man. Whilst he says of Durban, in no other city have I encountered as much beauty and so much friendliness from all the races and yet so much despair. He visited Cape Town hospitals where he notes in despair again, apartheid must be adhered to lest the little black homo sapiens be cured or die beside little white homo sapiens. In Stellenbosch, an argument over apartheid with an Afrikaans professor leads him to conclude, the hardest thing in the world is to be a moderate, to see both sides and yet to stand for the truth alone if necessary. Collis was, he believed, a moderate. Accepting the otherness of Jews and Africans was not extreme to him, was not apartheid, was not Nazism. It was just the way things were. In 1968, whilst at boarding school in Ireland, Sean was tragically killed in an accident and returning to Ireland for good, Collis's African post-Belson adventure was over. Indeed, in 2006, Zoltan reflected of his adopted father. He was like Francis Drake or Walter Raleigh, an adventurer great on the open sea with the wind in his hair, less great in the small pond of family life. To read Zoltan's memoirs is not only to glimpse something of what it meant to revolve around Collis at the centre of this remarkable family, but also to return to the relationship between Collis and Jews. Despite his obvious gratitude to Collis, Zoltan describes him as always more of a father figure than a father. Zoltan's descriptions tell of the old world influence on his world citizen father. He tells this wonderful story where he says of his father, I am not going anywhere until someone finds my sock. And there he sat stubbornly. He was sitting on his sock. We all knew it, but none of us was brave enough to tell him. So we all rushed around pretending to look for it. Zoltan continued, what a contradiction he was. Tender and gentle then an austere and dignified Victorian father, and then this ogre who couldn't find his sock. He was a man of many parts, but no matter what situation he was in, he was always the boss. Zoltan was not raised Jewish. Indeed, he recalls, Bob never talked about Belson to me. It wasn't mentioned, it just never happened. Zoltan attended a Quaker church and married an Irish Catholic, much to the confusion of his future father-in-law, Zoltan said, I tried to, tried to explain where I came from and that I was really Irish, even if I didn't sound or look it. The fact that I wasn't a Catholic was a lot for him to take in in itself, never mind the rest of my tangled background. Of course, Collis might have said Zoltan's Jewishness stopped him from being Irish, if, that is, he had raised his adopted son as Jewish. But Jewishness seemed to stay with Zoltan, both more positively in a sense of shared characteristics. He comments of Hans, his mother's ad or adopted mother's admiration of her Jewish patients in the East End, and says what she really meant was the Jewish attitude to life 
the humour, the coping mechanisms developed over millennia. I like to think I have inherited some of those things and as a perpetual feeling of otherness. When he and his sisters changed their names to Zin Collis, he says, neither Edith nor myself felt like Collis. We were always Zin. Zoltan concludes of Collis, he had a huge heart that it manifested himself best in the expansive arena of communities, cities, and even countries. A final contradiction then, the man who tried to build his own version of a borderless family and the man who didn't know how to be a father. Within his own mythology, Collis had constructed the universal homo sapien family, what Paul Gilroy has, uh, would later label as uh, following the ideals of planetary humanism. The family was as much Jewish perhaps as African as Irish and so on. It was also specifically Jewish because of his journeys into the pre-war uh, world of port Jews and then into Belsen and the lost Jewish world that he and his wife encountered and attempted to save and nurture in their own unconventional way. Through his prolific writings, he created an archive of his Jewish encounters. His family was part of the dynamics of Jewish diaspora and through his post-war encounters with Africa of what Gilroy again has dubbed the Black Atlantic. And yet, Collis was never free from his unreconstructed old world thinking on Jews, Blacks, anyone who he categorized as essentially different to himself as a public school educated Irishman. His adopted son, Zoltan, that little enchanting scrap, part of the tiny remnant of the old world of Eastern European Jewry that had miraculously survived, was brought up in Ireland, both distant from his new father and that of the faith and culture of his murdered family. He became Ireland's most famous Holocaust survivor, the one who never acknowledges his Jewishness. The family or families of Robert Collis thus illustrate that Jewishness is always contested and fluid, unclassifiable and uncertain. To conclude, through the study of Glenn Hughes and Bob Collis, <clears throat> the impact of Belson on our medical liberators is clear to see. Both are complicated figures, and if Hughes seems less so, we might contrast Collis's, albeit clumsy, criticism of apartheid with Hughes's crude opposition to the rugby boycott of South Africa, and rugby meant a lot to Hughes. For all his essentializing, Collis and Han were remarkable in not only restoring the desperately damaged health uh, of the Jewish orphans, but also in their determination to find out who they were and what their past was. When Collis wrote in the British Medical Journal in 1946, of a little boy of five whose parents had been cruelly murdered and said, what is to become of him? Is he to be brought up a Jew or Catholic? It was because he cared deeply about those he had rescued back to life. Hughes hated that his first task at Belson was not to take care of the individual, but to make instant decisions en masse of who might survive or not if given basic medical support. His humane approach to medicine was reflected throughout his career, including his important intervention in terminal care, Peace at Last, which was decades ahead of its time in 1960, was undoubtedly influenced by his work in Belson. The personalities of Hughes and Collis were very different, and it is not surprising that they nearly came to blows in the liberated concentration camp. But they shared a deep humanity and decency, treating the victims of the Holocaust with deep compassion. Lastly, whilst their post-war lives were very dissimilar, in both cases, as remarkable co-presence, and certainly not just as witnesses to Belson, they became part of and created Jewish families of Holocaust survivors. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Tony, and thank you, Amy, for a, a wonderfully uh, rich, uh, powerful lecture, which um, you know, not only told some interesting life stories, but I, I thought um, 
introduced us to some, some often quite astonishing material, actually, um, and material that one doesn't often uh, really come across. So, so that was, that was really um, super. I'm, I'm imagining that it takes people a little bit of time to, to gather their thoughts and uh, gather, their, gather their questions on a, um, on a platform such as this. Um, but we, we do have the opportunity to take questions um, either via the, the uh, chat function or the, the Q&A function. So do um, please feel free to um, <clears throat> quickly um, bash your, um, your questions into those. Um, don't worry too much about the grammar. I'll polish that up as I, um, <laughs> as I pass it on. Um, Right. <clears throat> so, um, first of all, we we have a question on your um, ter terminology, I suppose, um, and that's the uh, the move you've made in the direction of talking about co-presence. Mm -hmm. um, can you expand upon this and and say what what um, what work that 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 term does for you uh, that that other terms perhaps don't. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, and Amy want, might want to add to it, but I think we are sort of frustrated of, you know, I think there's a general frustration of the term <coughs> which covers you know, vast amounts of, of, of historical actors, but also suggests you know, in its sort of purer, uh, both dictionary and sort of legal uh, courtrooms uh, approach of sort of neutrality and, and uh, uh, sort of uh, lacking an interaction so that we're not alone in querying that and some want to maintain that and sort of bring in agency to the bystander. Uh, for us, uh, and, and then uh, Michael Rothberg's very recent intervention of, of trying to sort of get beyond that because we're talking a very, very uh, troubling sort of history, say, of the Polish uh, nation and uh, it's, it's ongoing struggle to sort of come to terms with what happened, either going from a sort of very defensive position or a very aggressive position, uh, particularly those from outside. And so I think Rothberg's implicated subjects is, is useful to, to bring in agency and choice. For us, it doesn't work um, because the people we're dealing with are, are not in that same position but they are more than witnesses. Um, and I think that's, uh, whereas witnesses often use, particularly with, with, with uh, liberation, and yes, they were witnesses to some of that. Um, so it works for us in what is going to be a series of case studies uh, of the Belson liberators, particularly, and uh, a group of about 1500 British POWs in Auschwitz III um, in the sort of slave labor camp where they are more than just uh, there, they are in some ways victims, um, but they are more than that. Uh, in terms of the Auschwitz POWs, there's also an element of, of uh, animosity that comes out against the, their fellow uh, inmates. Uh, but it, it's, so you could say, well, that term co-presence um, are, uh, is, is, is very, maybe it works very well for our case studies. Could we then expand this um, beyond that uh, to other historical actors in the Holocaust and beyond? And I think it could be uh, when we were talking about this at another occasion in, in, with different types of, of, of co-presence, we were asked, would people like James Parks or mm -hmm. Eleanor Rathbone or Victor Galantz who engaged with what was happening during the war, before it and during the war especially, and tried to sort of get uh, some action from the British government and beyond, I think they would fit and that they made themselves co-present even though they're physically a huge way removed and experientially a huge way removed, they put themselves in that position, as did many ordinary people in Britain at that time. And I think the same is true in other Western democracies at this point in the, in the Allies. So, it has a, a wideness there. Whether it would work for, say, you know, your classic case of, of collaborating nations um, or occupied nations um, becomes perhaps more problematic. I, I'm not sure. I still think it, it, it means that we can deal, I think going back to that original use um, 
in relation to the Nazi, uh, those that lived around the Nazi camps. I think it works very well because it, it's not just that they happened to live around, but they knew what was happening. Uh, they had some degree of agency. Some of them made certain choices. And, and so I think it works in a wider way. It also, I'm, a, I'm rambling. Uh, it, I think it also avoids easy moralization. Um, and I think that's important that we, we tend to sort of have heroes and villains and that um, I'm, I suppose, more drawn to Collis than Amy is because I think he's a lovable rogue uh, in <laughs> spite of all of his appalling things he says, that there's something you draw, and yet he's... There is some... he, I think it's because he also has a, it's a, it's sort of a, a sort of rich cultural life going on with him both before and afterwards, and I think he has a kind of perhaps a creativity or a... Um, uh, a dramatic element to how he sees the world that perhaps Hughes doesn't. That may be being unfair to Hughes, but Hughes is an army man. You know, he's shown incredible bravery during the First World War. He has the military cross, he, you know, he's DSO, he, you know, he's a soldier, um, you know, and, and to a certain extent doesn't perhaps have the same tools maybe to express what he, he's seen and, and felt. Um, you know, and but I don't think that makes him less interesting. I mean, he's the one who's sort of returning to Belson, isn't he? Much you know, more, he's very, very present with the survivors. Um, uh, Collis is, yes, yeah, certainly sort of more expressive, and, and as you can see, sort of mixed up about what, what he thinks and where he's coming from. But that make him more entertaining to Tony. Mm. <laughs> but um, I think on the co present thing, also, we were. Um, again thinking about this and the idea of, of that looking at the co-presence in the particular context of the liberation of Belson also helps to challenge this notion that that liberation and the point of the arrival of, of the British or the Americans is the end um, and that instead what this goes to show is that in fact it's not and, and that the processes of, of engaging with and experiencing and understanding the Holocaust go on both in the sites themselves but then in the lives of these individuals until you know until their last days so I think that's a good sort of uh, way into or a good part of this co-present notion is that it, it stops that sort of idea of 45 that's it it's over mm -hmm. super um thank you um <clears throat> we've got uh, two or three uh, more questions sort of uh, rolling in now um so let me just go to the next one in turn um uh which uh, is really to ask you, I think, Amy, to, to say a little bit more about Collis's view of Jewishness and Judaism um, before the war. Um, I, I, is there anything in your material that you've looked at that would enable you to sort of... Uh, yeah, I mean, again, I think it's sort of, uh, thank you for the question, it's, it's picking up a little bit of what we were, I think, trying to get at here, is that he has a very... Um, it's difficult to read kind of approach to it. And this is where we were thinking about this notion of him sort of performing or, or sort of expressing this anti-Semitism or trying to explore it <clears throat> in himself. That might be a very generous reading of him um, because he, you uh, <laughs> kind of like that. He, there, is, there are comments, you know, in, in the 1930s, you know, before, obviously before the war, before he's um, seen what he sees in, in 45, that are, are anti-Semitic um, and he is sort of, he, when he, he spends a lot of time in London, he goes around London and he identifies, he wrote a text called The Silver Fleece, um, which is his autobiography and it's probably a mark of the man that he wrote his autobiography at 36 years old. Um, and in that he um, describes wandering London and he has sort of, again, boxed in sections of the city that belong to Jews and foreigners or Jews and immigrants. Um, and then there are the Cockneys. So he says, if you go on out to the Elephant and Castle, you get the proper Englishman. So he, he definitely has this um, racialized ethnic notion that they are, that the difference, there's, a, there's mm. a real difference and they belong in, they stay together and they belong in particular places. And this clearly troubles him or is something that he thinks is worthy of comment because he comes back to it again and again and again. So I think if, if that answers the question, he, he has a problem uh, with, with Jewishness and the idea of Jewish identity well before um, he sees what he sees in 45. Great. Thank you. Super. Um, 
So I, I'm assuming that one sort of was, was, was mainly um, aimed, aimed uh, at, at um, Amy to answer. Um, we, th we then have a question about the um, the positive post-war relationship between uh, Glenn Hughes and the um, the Belson survivors, um, which obviously sort of compares to the often less than positive encounters between the British occupation powers and Jewish DPs at Belson. So, um, what do you think accounts for this uh, positive um, post-war relationship between Hughes and the survivors? Is um, is the question? I think. Mm. I think mean, that's a really good question because it, it doesn't, there's nothing in his background that you would say, right, this is where he's going to go, other than that he's a very decent man. But then so is Collis, a very decent man, but he's, he's, you know, he's still doing these strange things. You know, why do you start a book, which is a really good history of, of Auschwitz and Belson from a Jewish perspective? Why do you start it as Collis does? by saying, I don't like Jews, and I don't know why, and I'm not really bothered why, but you know, it's, there's something that he's performing there. So he's, whereas with Hughes, all we know is that he immediately identifies with the Jews there. He employs a Polish Jewish nurse uh, from who's been in Auschwitz, uh, who's one of the few Jews who gives her testimony at the Belson trial, and trusts her and works with her very closely, gets to know the people, gets to know Rosensaft, who is a real wheeler dealer, uh, a brilliant politician coming out of, out of uh, Belsa. And, you know, he's a complicated figure as well, this great figure, Zionist figure, who doesn't settle in Israel. Um, Worked that one out. So I mean, again, categories become very complicated. But Hughes does, you know, does seem to be something that he, it's not contrived. He seems very comfortable. He goes to bar mitzvahs and of all of these survivors and Rosensaft is clearly very close to. Him. And they become his people. And it is, you know, that that wanting, almost like Kaddish said at his funeral and, and Levy to, to sort of perform that, I'm very close to Levy as a, you know, they, <clears throat> I suppose again, the slightly less emotional one, um, Hart, Leslie Hardman, who I've uh, talked about elsewhere, it is a much more emotional Jewish chaplain who was there just before um, Levy. So that it, it's a genuine attachment and not non, uh, it doesn't seem to be at all contrived. I mean, there are, you know, there are those that support a sort of Jewish, uh, a sort of Jewish state because they want Jews out of Britain. I don't think there's any evidence that that's part of his, uh, uh, out of Hughes's mentality. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think, you know, he's, he, there was a little quip we put in about Hughes at the very end opposing a rugby boycott of South Africa. And he labels one of the people who is supporting, one of the few rugby players who's supporting the band, just as a socialist. You know, so he's not, he's not your sort of, he's not a, a radical figure. Uh, he is, you know, he's a very, he's writing about uh, final life care. It, it's, you know, it's 50 years ahead of its time. Mm -hmm. um, so there is that sensitivity, and that goes back to what we started with, a, a sort of person's um, patient sense of medicine. He, he embraces that very early. And so there is that hum humanitarianism, decency. And I think it also, you know, maybe there is this strong anti-Germanism, which is hardly un unsurprising considering what he had experienced. Whereas Collis, for all of his centralism, gets out of that because he he's willing to sort of see that people can change. When, he, when Collis goes to Israel, he... He sort of writes about his surprise about how how normal it all is and how well the Jews are doing. So he's more flexible. Hughes, I think that that just sort of his sense of decency being a, a, appalled by what 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 he had experienced in, in, on the first day of, of proper liberation, um, which clearly never left him uh, and traumatized him, and that you know I think it was. An element of just these are he realized quickly, which not, not all of them did, that these victims were Jews. And it's exceptional in the Western camps that in of Belsen that most of them were Jewish. That's not true of, of Buchenwald and Dachau. Hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Amy, did you want to add? No, 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 no? no Okay, well, I, I, I gather that we, we had a hand raised as well. Um, Claire, April, which. Um, we just need briefly or quickly to unmute you, which I think Claire is going to do. Yeah, Claire will need to unmute herself now. Oh, Claire needs to unmute herself. So um, 
If you could do that, Claire. The other Claire. I did. Oh, what's wrong? Yeah, there you go. Um, I, I actually wasn't aware, but I, I might as well. As my my husband, who's sitting be beside me, his father was actually one of the liberators of, of Belson. He was of originally Polish uh, Jewish background, but was over here and uh, joined the British Army. And, and he always says, and it isn't in textbooks, that practically every British soldier who could lay their hands on the SS was killing them until no, the tank, the tank, the tank gone. You say, no. By the time my father got there, and uh, he was, I have to specify this, one of the first two infantrymen, uh, the tanks had arrived, and so you won't find it in the history books, but they were shooting every uh, SS man, etc. they could lay their hands on. And Dad basically said, look, uh, our lads are 10 minutes behind me. Of course, Dad had been sent there, because when they had the 40th reunion, I met this Scots lad, lad then, who uh, had been sent by bike, motorbike, met the Germans about half a mile outside of Belson, came straight back, saw Major Sheriff, Dad's company commander, uh, who then spread the word, obviously. But Major Sheriff got hold of my father, who spoke six languages, including German, Russian, Polish, and Yiddish. And he said, go straight there, and we'll be right behind you. So, and in fact, Dad found, well, they found him, actually. Three walking skeletons came towards him. They were cousins by marriage from uh, his hometown, and told him everybody had been wiped out. Dad still had nightmares, uh, and he died at 86, but he still had nightmares about it. But as I say, our tank lads were killing people. Well, people, Germans. The history, history book doesn't want to put that in, but I don't know whether you've got anything to say about that. I think they, there was certainly enormous and understandable anger. Um, I think, uh, you know, there were certainly some incidents. Um, the SS were made to do uh, very challenging tasks, and if they didn't fully um, obey, uh, they, yes, uh, I think a way, a, another way into this uh, briefly is, is, is the, and there is a very important British Jewish element, and that brings in Leslie Hardman as, 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 as the first chaplain, Jewish chaplain, and Hardman was wandering around uh, with a revolver um, and was told quite firmly, possibly by Hughes, um, uh, yes, by Hughes, you know, put that away uh, because he was, I think, Hardman was quite willing to use it um, and was in a state of, he just worked himself into a, into hysteria, a hysteria yeah. over it, an understandable one, and he wouldn't leave, he would not leave. And so the impact on, on the British Jews was, had its own element of, of trauma added to it. Uh, and, and also that shared language, if you refer to it, you know, to converse in, in, in Yiddish, uh, uh, was very, very important for the survivors and as communicators, like with, with uh, Benka, uh, uh, the, the nurse. Yeah. If, if, I mean, if I could interject there, if, if I understood rightly, that um, family story is one that you, you, you just became aware of, Claire, in the context of this um, lecture. Um, and that raises really fascinating questions, doesn't it, about, you know, the ways in which people speak and share and the ways in which they don't, um, which in a sense brings us back to the, um, you know, the, you know, some of the things that, 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 that Tony and Amy were, were talking about. Um, but it, it sort of set, set off, you know, sets off my own thoughts about um, the how, how these kind of very personal private stories um, on the sort of autobiographical level, um, how they map onto or don't map onto wider processes of, of knowledge formation uh, out there in, in British culture about, you know, what the Holocaust had been about, what it hadn't been about. Um, you know, I was thinking about the, um, I mean, some of the photographs that you showed us and wondering you know, what kind of a life they have in the post-war world? How, how do they move through the culture? Are they things that you just sort of found in an archive that have never seen the light of day? Or are they just in very small circulation 
books or do some of these become a bit more canonical i suppose uh, in in the visual archive um and and what are the mechanisms by you know that determine which of these images takes on a life and and, and which one doesn't I, d d that was a bit garbled but do you see what i'm trying to get at there are some i think we we avoided deliberately using any sort of horror images direct comic horror. and it's and i think that's something that uh, Holocaust scholarship over the last 10, 15 years, and not just in scholarship, but also in museum work, is, is querying. You know, on the one hand, you've got the shortest way to show graphically the horrors of the Holocaust or of Nazism. On another, the dehumanization of the victims is continued by it. So it's that that is a very, very difficult dilemma. So those are the, if you like, iconic photographs and moving images of Belson, um, which we're now looking at wanting to use more sparingly, but there are lots of other images which the Imperial War Museum have been very good at sort of restoring and trying to get better known of the days after that, where Jewish life gets re-established. Although, of course, to interrupt, mm. they still have, um, you know, as the dominant image uh, in their exhibition on the Holocaust and in their section on liberation, their dominant image is still the Tommy, the, the British soldier with the bulldozer. Um, moving the huge piles of bodies. So again, they preserve these other images, but the one they choose to use, or the one that has the biggest space, is is the that iconic and yet horrifying, dehumanising image. Mm -hmm. oh, um, and then images that were sort of less well known. We use some from uh, Collis's Straight On, which are of uh, of Sultan and the other children, which are incredibly you know, affectionate, and that you sort of read that alongside these things where you'd, you know, if you're in a pub with, with Collis, you'd sort of make your excuses and socially distance several cities away. But at the same time, that incredible deep understanding. And I think there was uh, a question about the medical care. That's, and you know, Collis, in a sense, was, was luckier than Hughes in that he went in a little bit later and it was a more defined issue of the children. And the children are slightly bad, you know, they're in terrible state, but the ability to be able to help them. And he was a brilliant pediatrician. And that they, whereas a lot of the medical students write in incredibly uh, dense medical language about ulcers and you know, everything is, is just. Is, is measured and, and because they're trying to do it like it was a medical um, book, uh, not book, but the sort of report, report. You know, they've done their rounds and, and so on. Again, of getting away from that patient centered, whereas Collis gets to know who they are uh, and, and, and befriends them, uh, uh, with, particularly with his, his new partner, so that he's there is a there's a real sense which goes right through it of his career. of of getting to know who people, who these children are and their parents and so on. Whereas Hughes, I think, just finds that appalling thing where he has to, um, has to make these decisions of who does he think might survive? And he knows he makes mistakes, that a lot of those that go to the sort of quickly made hospital are not going to survive. And maybe some of those that might have had a chance, I mean, he has to make that. And he does it with enormous compassion. So the medical care is remarkable considering the, the small amount of people, the resources they had. So we can make criticism and that's not what we would, we, I think that would be very unfair on them. I think the medical students found themselves really at a loss to know what to do. What was needed was nursing and not really medical care without all the possibilities. You know, they did their best, but they were pretty much out of their depth because you know, there was nothing much they could do. Thank you. Um, I think that that actually um, answers one of the other sort of questions that that I, I haven't raised about the um, you know the quality of the, um, the medical care. So I won't I won't wheel that one out again. Um, but but thank you for to, to, to the person who asked that one. Um, another another one has um, just popped in. I haven't actually had a chance to 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 read it um, properly. Um, but we're, we're, you're you're being asked. Um, it, can, can, how far the Holocaust can be differentiated um, from the, or the ways in which 
um, sort of college seems to separate out the experience of the Holocaust and um, uh, a sort of more everyday anti-Semitism, or not to make connections between the experience of one and the need perhaps to avoid the other, um, seems um, actually not to be unusual. Uh, that, that, that there's maybe a sort of um, a quality to the sort of everydayness of anti-Semitic uh, prejudice that enables people to d dissociate what what they know about the Holocaust with what they think is still speakable or sayable about Jews. Um, so I guess the question is 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 asking how how surprised you are really that you you come across this kind of slightly um, split personality. Uh, as it were, somebody who, who 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 sees these horrors and yet can still be a sort of fairly everyday kind of uh, racist, really. <laughs> Not, <laughs> Not to put it to, you know. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> well, I mean, that's how I heard the story as well. Yeah, you know. Uh, yeah, and that, I think there is, I, and I think I and mean, myself disagree slightly over this that of how generous one can be to Collis. I yeah, exactly. I I think. Collis is perhaps doing because he's he's doing this not in the past but in a book published you know shortly after the war published by Matthew and so you know it's a it's going to sell a lot of copies he's a well-known figure he writes beautifully uh, and why why perform it at the start of the book when he's going to describe all of these things other than to sort of put it out there and I think he's this is where I'm being incredibly generous to him because he doesn't change his, his writing remains similar through the to the seventies. Orwell does it much more self-critically in an essay on anti-Semitism in nineteen forty-five, where he looks at his own background, his sort of public school colonial background, and says, "That's what I was taught, and I'm challenging myself to stop thinking this way." And he doesn't fully succeed himself, but he makes a pretty good effort. And I wonder if you know, there's an element of that with Collis. Otherwise, why put it in to the start of a book on Belson and Auschwitz about his traveling around London? You know, it starts off, I'm going around London, and it's all blitzed and everything. Having come back from Belson, and look, there's the Jewish court, and I don't like him. I mean, it's just too blatant for him not to make the connection. I think he's making a connection, and he's saying to himself, I didn't even think why I thought that. No need to. Why is he putting it out there? Uh, mm. Whereas a lot of other people would do that privately and not make that. Uh, you know, so I think that process, we, we think that 1945 is it, and it isn't. And I think that's where James Parks comes in very neatly when he was asked how long it would take to remove anti-Semitism. He said, well, 400 years at least, because it's ingrained in culture. And we think the Holocaust is going to bump, that's going to end it all. And Collis is sort of showing us really how difficult that is. So he's got this wonderful universalism and that humanity, and yet he's also got this sort of... He does have a colonial yeah. attitude and approach as yeah. well, despite his own so his Irishness. And so the, the, the work he does in Africa, a lot of that starts from the premise, you know, that these are people that need to be... Um, educated, need to be cultured, need to, you know, he, he and Han adopt, adopt a sort of position in, in the upper white classes in Nigerian society and sort of it's all pink gins and, and what have you. And, and you know, he, he does, again, this toing and froing where he can be incredibly compassionate, but then will say something appalling. Um, and it's as though I, 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 I'm not 100% convinced he doesn't mean it I think he, he feels he can do a good job as you know because he's saying we all got on as doctors so if they're all in a professional environment and and he can he can respect them as doctors then that's okay but he won't go in their homes um and or he'll there's a there's a where he says something about you know that he'd he'd gone to Israel and that um, you know, how much easier it was to understand Jews, you know, now that they were in their own country where that, you know, they weren't foreigners in, in other people's lands. Um, and, and they're different now. They're different because they're here. Um, it, it's difficult because the Irishness, one would assume, would perhaps allow him more of a nuanced view to being an outsider or to being othered by, by a colonial power but he I don't think he does that 
Well, there is, you know, there's a, a central racialization, yeah. but then there's a, an adjustment that these are not fixed terms. And this is, you know, sort of, uh, I don't know, I, I mean, this was something that only Neil would understand, but it, there's a sort of touch of, of the Kevin Sharp about him, of how much does he mean some of this and how much is he performing it, that he, uh, he is, yeah, he's totally un-PC, and yet he's an internationalist who does, when it comes to it, does all the hard stuff. Um, you know, in that sense, I'd be much more comfortable with him than someone that says all the right stuff and does nothing. And that, you know, just Which is not Hughes. Mm. Hughes does not say all the right stuff and do no, nothing. No, and Hughes, you know, Hughes is, is Hughes is too clean, really. But he's, but I think there's a lot. I think if we start to dig, it'll be more complicated. But that just that that ability to identify, which I think again is co-present, makes you allow allows you to do yeah. that. Mm-hmm. Well, before. Um, uh, Amy and Tony sort of, um, you know, before <laughs> <laughs> it's the end of a beautiful friendship. <laughs> and on that note of what I took the sort of vague um, agreement between the two of them, um, I'd um, really uh, mindful also of the fact that y- y- many of us have had actually had quite long days on screens already. Um, uh, life being what it is these days. Um, I, I like to to wrap things up um uh above all i'd really like to um thank tony uh, and amy for for uh, again for a wonderfully uh, rich nuanced provocative uh and an innovative paper which um certainly opened up all sorts of um histories that that i was completely unfamiliar with and showed us how it's possible to kind of really rethink some big questions uh on the basis of some you know, very everyday um, material. Um, so I, I, one, one uses so many of these online platforms that I, I, I can't quite remember how, how one best shows one's appreciation on Zoom. Um, but um, if you have um, a, a thumbs up or whatever function, um, uh, do please um, put your thumbs up. Um, uh, I'm sure, though, um, I'm speaking for everybody who um, who listened to this um, when, I, when I say how grateful we are to you for, uh, for, for offering us that. Um, now, I'm just going to finally uh, hand the floor over to uh, Claire Lafolle, who 